Wow. Greetings, everyone, and welcome to the Law Hour and Editorial Review. Now, the Law Hour is an educational service brought to you in the public interest. I'm your narrator, George Gordon. Now, the Law Hour and Editorial Review is heard nationally and internationally seven days a week here in the United States and around the world in more than 120 countries worldwide over the Internet. For more information about the Law Hour and Editorial Review, please visit our webpage at georgegordonlaw.org. Again, that's georgegordonlaw.org. Now, the Law Hour and Editorial Review brings you important information about law, science, education, politics, religion, health, history, economics, news, and current events. All right, last time I said we'd take a look at Stanley Monteith, and he's, he's a pretty logical guy. Pretty, pretty interesting guy to listen to. I've heard him a time or two. I have a, a monograph that he wrote some years back. Let's see, I've got it. It's uh, 132,000, so it's five years old. Talking about the Global 2000 Population Reduction Program. Now, I've reported on Global 2000, the Committee of 300, and I've given you some information concerning this. Dr. John Coleman, for instance, back in 1992, put out a little book called Global 2000, a blueprint for global genocide. Global genocide. We're talking about killing. We're talking about eliminating 90% of the world's population. Now, when, when you say that, you know, normal people look at you like, my God, this guy's flipped out. Why, this guy has got to be a blathering idiot. To believe such a thing. Well, yeah, I believe such a thing because I believe Bible prophecy. I believe the scripture means what it says and says what it means. So I told you in the last program, I gave you three or four citations where God himself says, I'm going to reduce the earth's population by 90%. That's that's the creator. That's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I can't speak for Allah. I can't speak for Buddha. I don't know what Jesus has got in mind. I'm just here to tell you that the God of Abraham is going to go ballistic on us pretty shortly. He said he's going to go ballistic. He said time and time again in Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28, two key prophetic chapters, he said, here's what I'm going to do if you guys don't toe the line. Okay, we didn't toe the line, and I take a look at Hurricane Katrina and Hurricane Rita and Hurricane Stan. I take a look at this earthquake over in Pakistan. I look at the natural calamities. I look at earthquakes over the past 30 years. They're becoming more intense and more frequent. I see the devourer hurricanes coming in and devouring our substance. So I put two and two together, and I say, this this, this, this doesn't sound like it's working out very well for us. Now, for the first 150 years, we Americans couldn't do anything wrong. Everything we did and everything we touched turned to gold. Starting about 1950, the worm turned. Just about everything that we touch turns to SH, and in short order. Now, this population control agenda is a story that you need to hear. I don't I'm not concerned about whether you believe it or not. My job isn't to convince you that I'm right. My job is to present facts. I'm a reporter. I just present the story, what you do with it's your business. So here's the story, population control agenda. Stanley Monteith, he's a medical doctor, M.D., retired now, and operates www.radioliberty.com. That's all one word, R-A-D-I-O-L-I-B-E-R-T-Y.com. You can probably get this article and probably many more like it from that website. He says, one of the most difficult concepts for Americans to accept is that there are human beings dedicated to coercive population control and genocide. Now, many readers will acknowledge that our government is helping to finance the Red Chinese program of forced abortion, forced sterilization, infanticide, and control of the numbers of live births in China. Most readers will accept the fact that our nation is helping to finance the United Nations Worldwide Family Planning Program, a form of population control. 
And most rational men and women, however, find it impossible to believe that such programs are really part of a master plan to kill off large segments of the Earth's population. So I shall have to admit that I studied the policies of AIDS, that's HIV disease, for over a decade before I finally came to a horrifying conclusion as a medical doctor, that the real motivation behind efforts to block utilization of standard public health measures to control the further spread of the HIV epidemic was population control. Now, that was not an easy concept for me as a medical doctor to acknowledge, despite the fact that I had long recognized that the 20th century has been the bloodiest hundred-year period in all of mankind's recorded history. And it was not until I journeyed to Elberton, Georgia, and I stood within the dark shadows of the great druid-like monument built there, and I read the words engraved on the massive stone pillars of that structure that I finally came to accept the truth. It was at that point that it became obvious to me that just as our Lord has given mankind ten commandments to guide our lives, so too... Those from the dark side have been given their instructions from the one they worship, Satan the devil. The ten programs of the guides are inscribed in eight different languages on the four great granite pillars of America's Stonehenge. That message foretells a terrifying future for humanity. And it explains why efforts to approach the AIDS epidemic from a logical point of view have been consistently thwarted. I want to pause right here and make an observation. Do you know what country in the world has the lowest incidence of HIV AIDS in the world? Lowest incidence of contagion is in Cuba. Cuba. Those commie pinkos down there in Cuba have the lowest incidence of, lowest incidence now of HIV in the world. And do you know why? They practice quarantine down there. Quarantine. They take the sickos and they lock them up forcibly. I know. I know. It's a terrible thing to do. And it just boggles your mind, but it's called quarantine. And and as a result of that quarantine, they have shut the HIV epidemic in Cuba down. While it is exploding in Africa and Asia, and it is growing in every country in the world, it has been stopped dead by the use of quarantine. Now, do you know where quarantine comes from, boys and girls? The concept of taking sick people and locking them up and keeping them out of the healthy population, it comes from the Bible. Did you know that there are eight statutes in the Bible? Leviticus 13.11, Leviticus 13.21, 13.26, 13.31, and 45 through 46. Numbers 5, verses 1 through 4, and Deuteronomy 23, verses 10 and 11. There are eight statutes that prescribe quarantine in the Bible. We don't practice it here in white Christian America. You don't practice this quarantine in Canada, Australia, or New Zealand, or Western Europe, or England, or Russia, or any place in the world, except Cuba. Just thought I'd pass that one along to you. Now, he goes on to say, before you scoff and reject my suggestion as some sort of madness, why don't you check out my references the bibliography, and then try to disprove my, disprove my conclusions. If my allegations are unfounded, you will soon recognize the deception and return to your daily activity certain that there's no cause for concern or alarm. But on the other hand, should you determine that my assessment is in fact correct or even partially correct, then you have a moral obligation to decide just what part you intend to play in the response to this unfolding world genocide, how you will protect yourself and your loved ones and the countless millions of helpless human beings throughout the world who have been marked for destruction, marked to die. 
Now, you must never forget the warning recorded for prosperity by Martin Niemöller. He was the Lutheran minister who lived in Hitler's Germany during the 1930s. His words echoed down to us over succeeding decades. Listen to what he said. He said, quote, In Germany they came first for the communists, and I didn't speak up because I wasn't a communist. Well, then they came for the Jews, and I didn't speak up because I wasn't a Jew. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I... Didn't speak up because I wasn't a trade unionist. Then they came for the Catholics, and I didn't speak up because I was a Protestant. Then they came for me. And by that time, there wasn't anybody left to speak up. Unquote. Now, you'll note that Reverend Niemöller warned that after coming for the Jews, the Nazis came for both Catholics and Protestants. Now, why is that fact never mentioned? The question that I most frequently asked asked is this. How can you possibly believe that there are people who intend to kill off large segments of the world's population? And my answer is really quite simple. I hold that belief because I have read their warnings and I've read their writings. I believe that they're telling the truth, just as Adolf Hitler wrote of his plans for Europe in Mein Kampf, which is translated my plan. So, too, those who intend to depopulate large segments of the earth have written of the necessity of limiting the world's population. And I believe that they fully intend to exterminate a significant portion of the world's population. The number that they use in their own writings is 90%. Now, the fact that the vast majority of Americans have never heard of their intent of the Georgia Guidestones in Elberton or of the plan and the hierarchy attests to the degree of control that exists over what the American people have been allowed to know about the occultic forces which are working within our society today. Now, as you read on, you will soon discover that I have primarily relied upon material which can be readily found in books, audio taped interviews, and public news sources, such as Margaret Sanger and Planned Parenthood. So if you take the time to check out my references, you'll soon discover that there really are those who have publicly advocated the elimination of human weeds and the cleansing of society. And these people are in places and positions of power within the Trilateral Commission, the Bilderberger, and the Council on Foreign Relations. And indeed, to this very day, your tax money is being used to finance plant Planned Parenthood, which is an organization founded by Margaret Sanger. During the 1930s, Margaret Sanger openly supported the Nazi plan for genetic engineering of the German population and the propagation of a super race. Margaret Sanger was an American. In Planned Parenthood's 1985 annual report, leaders of that organization proclaimed that they were proud of our past and planning for our future. Planned Parenthood, by the way, is one of the fundamental organizations that teach sex education in the public schools of America. Now, how could anyone possibly claim to be proud of an organization founded by Margaret Sanger when history records that she wrote of the necessity of, quote, the extermination of human weeds, the cessation of charity, the segregation of morons, misfits, and the maladjusted, and the sterilization of genetically inferior races? Gee, I wonder who these genetically inferior races are that need to be sterilized. Margaret Sanger published The Birth Control Review, and in that magazine she openly supported the infanticide program promoted by Nazi Germany in the 1930s and publicly championed Adolf Hitler's goal of Aryan white supremacy. And in the years prior to World War II, Margaret Sanger commissioned Ernst Rudin, a member of the Nazi party and director of the dreaded German medical experimentation programs, to serve as an advisor 
to her organization here in the United States. And in his excellent book, Killer Angel, George Grant chronicles the life and writings of Margaret Sanger and painstakingly documents Sanger's plans for the genetic engineering of the human race. George Grant noted that in the 1920s, Margaret Sanger wrote, quote, the pivot of civilization in which she called for, quote, the elimination of human weeds for the cessation of charity because it prolonged the lives of the unfit for the segregation of morons, misfits, and the maladjusted and for the sterilization of genetically inferior races, unquote. According to Grant, Margaret Sanger believed that the unfit should not be allowed to reproduce, and accordingly she opened a birth control clinic in the Brownsville section of New York City, an area populated by newly immigrated Slavs, Latins, Italians, and Jews, and she targeted the unfit for her crusade to save the planet, unquote. Nineteen years later, in 1939, Margaret Sanger organized her Negro Project, a program designed to eliminate members of what she believed to be an inferior race. Margaret Sanger justified her proposal because she believed that, quote, the masses of Negroes, particularly in the South, still breed carelessly and disastrously, with the result that the increase among Negroes, even more than among whites, is from that portion of the population least intelligent and least fit. Unquote. Now remember, this organization called Planned Parenthood is teaching your sons and daughters in sex education classes in your public schools today in the year 2005. Margaret Sanger then went on to reveal that she intended to hire three or four colored ministers to travel to various black enclaves to propagandize for birth control. She wrote, The most successful educational approach to the Negro is through a religious appeal. We do not want word to go out that we want to exterminate the Negro population, and the minister is the man who can straighten out that idea if it ever occurs to any of their more rebellious members. Unquote. I want to point out that AIDS is rampant in black Africa, and the objective is to eliminate the entire black race around the world, boys and girls. And AIDS is not... I want to repeat, AIDS is not an accident any more than the coming flu pandemic is an accident or the war in Iraq was just accidental. It's very intelligently planned. And the people who are planning these events are very intelligent people with a very intelligent plan. And they're executing it flawlessly. And to show you how flawlessly and how well the plan is being uh, executed, very few people in the world even know about the plan. You know, the best way to enslave a people is to make those people believe they're free. A man who is spouting off about his freedoms isn't concerned about his chains. Margaret Sanger's organization grew in power, influence, and acceptance. She began to write of the necessity of targeting religious groups for destruction as well, believing that the dysgenic races should include fundamentalists and Catholics, in addition to blacks, Hispanics, and American Indians. All right, so now you fundamentalists out there, you crazy religious right-wingers, you Catholics, you blacks, Hispanics, and American Indians, you have been targeted. Targeted for extermination. Just like Hitler targeted the Jews for extermination. Now, as the years went by, Margaret Sanger became increasingly obsessed with her occultic beliefs. 
occultic beliefs. I'm going to underline that because George Bush belongs to an occultic organization called Skull and Bones, and so does John Kerry. Those are occultic. Those are witchcraft practitioners. Adolf Hitler was a witchcraft practitioner. He was an occultist. Margaret Sanger is a witch. Margaret Sanger is an occultist. Now, along with Sanger's acceptance of the occult, she became increasingly hostile to both Christianity and the American precepts of individual freedom under God. Her distaste for America can be seen in her writings when she wrote, Birth control appeals to the advanced radical because it is calculated to undermine the authority of the Christian church. I look forward to seeing humanity free someday of the tyranny of Christianity, no less than capitalism, unquote. Margaret Sanger eventually embraced not only communism, but theophysy as well. Now, just what is theophysy? Well, theophysy is a covert occultic religion based upon the repudiation of God and the worship of Lucifer. And in modern-day America, theophysy is one of the most powerful hidden occult forces working behind the scenes in New York City, Washington, D.C., and across our nation today. How many times have you been told that Adolf Hitler killed six million Jews in the Holocaust? What you probably have never been told, however, is the segment of the Holocaust tragedy recorded by Professor Norman Cohn in his historical account of the Jewish Holocaust. It's called Warrant for Genocide. Professor Cohn chronicled the dark days of World War II, noting only about a third of the civilians killed by the Nazis and their accomplices were Jews. One third. Other peoples were marked out for dissemination, subjugation, and enslavement, and the civilian losses of some of these countries amounted to 11% to 12% of the total population of countries like Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Romania, and Poland. If Professor Cohn's figures are accurate, and I feel certain that they are, because other Jewish researchers have come up with similar numbers. And when they haven't, the Christians of America have allowed to learn the fact that in addition to the 6 million Jews murdered by the Nazis, somewhere between 7 and 12 million non-Jews, 7 to 12 million non-Jews were also ruthlessly liquidated in Hitler's Germany. Now, I believe this information has been intentionally suppressed because those who were killed were largely Christians. And the covert forces which control the reality of the American public today, that's your public news media, do not want the followers of Jesus Christ in our nation to awaken to their peril. Well, not until it's far too late. Now, Hitler hated... Not only the Jews and Judaism, he also hated Christians and Christianity as well. And why was that? Well, because Adolf Hitler, just like Margaret Sanger, was a disciple of Theophysy and of Madame Blavatsky, the founder of the religion that worshipped Lucifer. And accordingly, both Margaret Sanger and Adolf Hitler were energized by the same dark spiritual forces. The fact that most of our citizens have never heard of Madame Blavatsky, Theophysy, or that two of Theophysy's most ardent disciples were Adolf Hitler and Margaret Sanger, clearly reflects the degree of control that exists over what the American people have been allowed to learn about the occultic forces at work within our nation today. As a researcher on the subject of the occult, I regularly receive letters and publications from the Lucas Trust. The Lucas Trust of today is the modern-day extension of the Lucifer Publishing Company. The Lucifer Publishing Company is an organization founded by Alice Bailey during the early years of the 20th century. Alice Bailey was a disciple of Madame Blavatsky and the nominal leader of the Theosophical Society between the early 1900s and the late 1920s. 
Now, because the name Lucifer had such a bad connotation in those days, Alice Bailey changed the name of her organization from the Lucifer Publishing Company to the Lucas Trust. And you'll see on public television to this day, the Lucas Trust sponsors many of the programs and programming on PBS. The nature and beliefs of her organization, however, have always remained the same. The Lucas Trust of today is one of the major front groups through which theophysy works to influence life here in America. The supernatural powers that still energize the Lucas Trust today certainly come from the same dark spiritual forces that energized Madame Blavatsky, Adolf Hitler, and Margaret Sanger in generations past. Publications from the Lucas Trust regularly refer to the plan, the plan for humanity, the plan for humanity that has been established by the hierarchy, the hierarchy, part of that plan is inscribed on the great granite pillars of the American Stonehenge in Elberton, Georgia. It's called the Georgia Guidestones. A full discussion of the subjects of population control and occultism is far beyond the scope of this short monograph. Full documentation on these subjects will be found in my soon-to-be-published book, None Dare Call It Genocide. At this point, let me simply offer a few examples of the views expressed by those who publicly advocate population reduction and or genocide. David Graber A research biologist with the National Park Service was quoted in the Los Angeles Times book review section on October the 22nd, 1989, as saying, quote, human happiness and certainly human fecundity are not as important as a wild and healthy planet. I know social scientists who remind me that people are part of nature, but that is not true. We have become a plague upon ourselves and upon the earth until such time as homo sapiens should decide to rejoin nature. Some of us can only hope for the right virus to come along. The right virus to come along. Gee, I wonder if it could be this new bird virus. Michael Fox, when he was the vice president of the Humane Society of the United States, wrote, Mankind is the most dangerous, destructive, selfish, and unethical animal on the planet. In the first global revolution, published by the Council of the Club of Rome, an international elitist organization, the authors note that, quote, in searching for a new enemy to unite us, we came up with the idea that pollution, the threat of global warming, water shortages, famine, and the like would fit the bill. All of these dangers are caused by human intervention. The real enemy, then, is humanity itself. Let me pause right there. I'll put an arrow. And let me give you a reminder. Now, we often endorse or recommend books, papers, periodicals, newsletters to our listeners. These endorsements and recommendations that we give don't mean that the authors or publications that we're endorsing or recommending will necessarily reciprocate. That's all. Keep in mind that most of these authors and publications that we cite here on the Law Hour and Editorial Review may be hostile, political, religious, economic, sectarian, racial, or ethnic partisans, and their viewpoints may not be totally endorsed by the Law Hour. Now, these opinions, beliefs, comments, views, and expressions that you hear on this program are mine. They're mine alone. They don't necessarily represent the views, beliefs, or the opinions of the advertisers, the sponsors, the management, or the staff of this radio network or of this local radio station. Now, this monograph called Population Control has a number of footnotes in here, so I'm going to cite you a couple of three of these footnotes. He has this footnoted with 32 32 sources of information, such as Killer Angel, Special Welfare, Environmental Overkill, 
The World a Conservative Union. Copies of the text of Dr. Keene's remarks are available from Radio Liberty. A copy of the letter quoted from the Lucas Trust is available from Radio Liberty for researchers. Quotation from Yoko Ono was found on the website. I mean, every everything that this guy is telling you over here, he's got a document to cite the source of the information. So as a journalist and as a reporter, he's done his homework and he's done a He's done an adequate job, if not an outstanding, and I, I would say outstanding job, but at least it's adequate, bare minimum. Now, going on, he says, the Los Angeles Times of April the 5th, 1994, quote, quoted Cornell University professor David Pimentel speaking before the American Association for the Advancement of Science as saying that, quote, the total world population should be no more than 2 billion rather than the current 5.6 billion. Well, pray tell, what do you think these people have in mind to reduce the Earth's population from 5.6 billion in 1994 to 2 billion? Think about that, boys and girls. What would you do if that job was given to you? Mull that one over. Now, that means that uh, 3.6 billion people have to die. Are they going to die of old age and simply not be replaced? Are they going to die from a flu epidemic or pandemic? Are they going to die from AIDS or some other disease? Where are these diseases coming from? Are they man-made in, in uh, Fort Detrick, Maryland, through biological research and Army, the, the Army's biological warfare program? Or maybe somebody else's biological program, maybe in England, France, China, or Russia. In the UNESCO Courier of November 1991, Jacques Cousteau wrote, remember Jacques Cousteau? He said, quote, the damage that people cause to the planet is a function of demographics. It is equal to the degree of development. One American burdens the earth with much more than 20 Bangladeshis. This is a terrible thing to say. In order to stabilize world population, we must eliminate 350,000 people per day. It is a horrible thing to say, but it's just as bad not to say it. Unquote. That's Jacques Cristo. We need to eliminate 350,000 people a day. That's half the people of New Orleans every day. Bertrand Russell, in his book, The Impact of Science on Society, said, quote, At present, the population of the world is increasing. War, so far, has had no great effect on this increase. I do not pretend that birth control is the only way in which population can be kept from increasing. There are others. If a black death could be spread throughout the world once in every generation, survivors could procreate freely without making the world too full. The state of affairs might be somewhat unpleasant, but what of it? Really high-minded people are indifferent to suffering, especially that of others, unquote. Bertrand Russell. Negative Population Growth Incorporated of Teaneck, New Jersey, recently circulated a letter stating their long-range goal. They said, quote, We believe that our goal for the United States should be no more than 150 million people. Our size in 1950. For the world, we believe our goal should be a population of no more than 2 billion its size shortly after the turn of the century. Unquote. In the Global Assessment Report of the United Nations Sponsored Study Group, Phase 1, Draft Section 9, the authors quoted an expert who suggested that, quote, a reasonable estimate for an industrialized world society at the present North American material standard of living would be 1 billion people. At the more frugal European standard of living, 2 to 3 billion people would be possible. Now there's, 
more New Age influence on this line of thinking as well. Speaking at a roundtable discussion group at the Gorbachev Conference held in San Francisco in the fall of 1996. Dr. Sam Keen, a New Age writer and philosopher, stated that there was strong agreement that religious institutions have to take a primary responsibility for the population explosion. And he went on to say that, quote, we must speak far more clearly about sexuality, contraception, about abortion, about values that control the population, because the ecological crisis, in short, is the population crisis. Cut the population by 90%, and there aren't enough people left to do a great deal of ecological damage. Now, there's your 90% number. Now, I cited to you Isaiah 6, verse 13. The God of Abraham said he's going to save a tithe of us alive. In in Psalm 91, verse 7, he says, Some of us are going to live to see 10,000 bodies on our right hand and a thousand dead bodies on the left, but you'll walk through them upright, and it won't happen to you. In Revelation chapter 6, the God of Abraham talks about a disease plague, an epidemic that will kill the fourth part of men. Now, the population of the earth, as I speak, is approximately 6 billion it, it hit 6 billion a few years back. It's a little over that now. And we're adding about 100 million people to the population every year. So about every 10 years, we're adding a billion people to the population. So in 2000, we hit 6 billion. In 2010, there should be 7 billion. In 2020, there's probably going to be 8 billion, you know, on up the line. Now, these these eugenics philosophers and scientists and, and uh, population control experts and so on, I call them the mad scientists and, and uh, preachers and politicians, they have a plan, and they want to reduce the Earth's population and the impact that mankind has upon it. And from a purely evolutionary viewpoint of the world's geopolitics, it makes all the sense in the world. If you believe in evolution, and if you discount the creator of the universe, the world is only so big, boys and girls, and there's only so much room on it. And populations of jackrabbits in the desert, they multiply in the absence of coyotes. And then when the population gets to be so big, I remember one time I was driving across Wyoming, and I noticed these these little furry spots in the in the road. And I got to looking at them. And I said, what are those? Those are those are jackrabbits that have been smashed on the road. And I started counting them. And in one one section between mileposts, that's one mile, I counted. 56 jackrabbits in one mile that had been run over by cars. And then there'd be 40 in the next one and 45 or 50, but 56 was the, was the, the champion. And I'm driving across and this is going mile after mile after mile after mile. Now, that's just the jackrabbits that are getting run over. Now, this is a population explosion. When that happens naturally, the population grows until the food supply gives out, and then there's a collapse of the population. It doesn't kill them all. There's two or three that survive. The the coyotes have plenty to eat, and so they multiply, and then they, they help to bring this into balance. There's a natural process for doing that. Mankind does not have a predator. We haven't gotten to the point where the food supply has caused the population around the world to collapse. We have not seen that. We have not experienced that. Now, if the world is having a hard time today feeding 6 billion people, remember I've told you, in in the 1970s, the, the world food supply for everybody in the world, you know, when there was about 4 billion people, was 73 days. Today it's down to 38 days and it's falling. Every year it goes down by two or three days. The world's food supply for the six billion people that are here 
has to double over the next 25 or 30 years because the population is increasing. We're going to go from 6 billion to 12 and from 12 to 24 and 24 to uh, 48 and 48 to 96. Now, at some point in time, boys and girls, when we get out here to 100 billion, 200 billion, 400 billion, 800 billion, I don't know how many people there are room for on this planet. But I do know that at some point in time, the population's going to collapse. That's all these thinkers are telling you. And they're saying, before we get to that juncture, let's step in and let's control the world's population right now. So they've started in China and India, birth control, abortion in the United States. And now they've introduced AIDS to kill off the blacks in Africa. And now... They're about to introduce us to a new killer virus. As this one thinker said, oh, that there was a virus that might solve this problem. Welcome, boys and girls, to Reality 2005. Reality time is just about upon us. There is now a convergence of Bible prophecy and the New World Order. We're just about to see the collapse of the world's population. And I think George Bush is just about to introduce it to us. He's he's telling us about this bird flu now. And where did it come from? It comes from a military guy. Remember, I told you that yesterday? A military guy and the Council on Foreign Relations. Not the CDC, not the Department of Health and Human Services. It comes from the military and one of the global think tanks that advocates, by the way, population control. Now, on the other side of the coin, there's there's the, the other side that says, well, there is a God, and this God over here has a plan that he's working out, and as these populations grow, it reaches a point where God will be satisfied with the number of people that are here, and at that point in time, he'll do something about it. And he said he's going to do something about it. It's going to collapse. It's going to collapse in what is known as the Great Tribulation. And the Great Tribulation comes upon all the people that live on planet Earth because of sin. And sin is called the transgression of the law. There's a limit to how much you can give the finger to old dad. There's a limit to how much you can tell him to kiss off before he goes ballistic on you and then says, okay, you want to get lippy with me, watch this. Now, mankind's been a little lippy with our Creator over the last hundred years. And I would submit to you that Hurricane Katrina and Hurricane Rita and Hurricane Stan, this earthquake that you see over here in in uh, Pakistan, is just the tip of the iceberg that is coming to fruition in Bible prophecy dis- discussed and, and explained in, in some detail. In Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28, Mar- uh, Matthew 24, Mark 13 and Luke 28, or Luke 21. Luke 21. Five good chapters there. All right, now we're talking about this new new age influence. 90%. Now some of these guys are talking about a world population of 1 billion, 2 billion, and this 90% would take us down to about 600 million, wouldn't it? Now Dr... Keene's remarks were met with applause from the assembled audience made up largely of New Age adherents, socialists, internationalists, and occultists. Many of the leading occultists of our modern world attending that meeting in San Francisco. Now remember, this is a meeting organized by Mikhail Gorbachev, the former director of the Soviet Union, KGB, their secret police, and then later, he became the president of Russia. Do you know where his headquarters is today? It's in the Presidio of San Francisco. This former communist head of the KGB and the Soviet Union is now operating one of these think tanks in the Presidio of San Francisco. No, isn't that just real special? 
Now, what is the message found on the Georgia Guidestones, and what is the plan of those guides? Well, if you read occultic literature, you'll soon find that those who worship Lucifer today refer to an hierarchy that guides both their actions and the affairs of the world. Now, who are the hierarchy? Well, the Lucas Trust, formerly the Lucifer Publishing Company, recently sent a letter to their supporters stating, quote, The spiritual hierarchy makes definite use of the 12 spiritual festival periods. We can learn to cooperate with the members of the hierarchy as they work to bring the divine plan to the attention of the men and women of goodwill and spiritual aspiration everywhere throughout the world. The idea of spiritual approach of hierarchy to humanity and humanity to hierarchy is the primary principle underlying meditation. Understanding of how the spiritual energies which flow through each zodiacal sign can illumine and inspire right human relations. Did you get that? Unquote. This hierarchy, this occultic religion, what we're talking about here, boys and girls, are religious people. This is humanism. This is spirit worship of Lucifer, not Jesus, not Allah, not some god out here. I mean, these guys worship the devil, and they don't make any bones about it. No bones about it at all. And they've got a plan, and they want to reduce the earth's population by up to 90%. You know, some of them say, well, it's just three quarters. You know, if you're going to reduce it from from six billion to two billion, that's that's uh, uh, two thirds. If you're going to reduce it to one billion, that's sixteen percent. If you're going to reduce it by ninety percent, that's six hundred thousand people. I mean, there's a lot of people have to die here, boys and girls, and we have never lived through a period where a billion people died on this planet. We haven't seen that. That's something of biblical proportions. That's that's something that reminds you of Noah's flood or of Moses leading the children of Israel through the Red Sea and the Egyptian army being destroyed in the Red Sea. I mean, it's, it's on that scope. It's on that plane. Now, the evil men who contrived the Nazi-style study called the infamous Tuskegee study. You ever heard of that? The infamous Tuskegee study? Well, before we get to that, the ancient Druids were members of an occultic religion. The circle of monuments at Stonehenge in England is occultic. The message engraved on the American Stonehenge in Elberton is occultic. Yoko Ono is the widow of John Lennon. John Lennon was a man who was deeply involved in the occult. Yoko Ono has written a musical score with three movements dedicated to the message of the Georgia Guidestones. And she was recently quoted as saying, quote, I want people to know about the stones. We're headed toward a world where we might blow ourselves up and maybe the world will not exist. It's a nice time to reaffirm ourselves, knowing all the beautiful things that are in this country and the Georgia stones symbolize that. Now, what is the message to modern day man which is engraved on the great stone pillars of the Druid-like monument in Elberton, Georgia? The first of the guides reads, quote, to maintain humanity under 500 million in perpetual balance with nature. That means the entire human race at its climax level for permanent balance with nature will be 500 million. Now that's less than 10% of the people that live on planet right now. Less than 10%. So when I tell you that there are plans out there, boys and girls, to reduce the Earth's population by 90%, I'm not whistling Dixie, throw a straw hat. 
Now, you may sit there and say, well, surely they will never succeed in their plan. Well, I don't know if they'll succeed or not. I just wanted to report to you that these people are pretty prestigious people. Yoko Ono, she's fairly well known. I mean, she's not sitting here in the pinnacle of power in the Oval Office, but she's not a nobody out here uh, either. She's got plenty of money, and she's one of the movers and shakers behind this program. Her husband, who's dead now, but his his uh, philosophies in life were dedicated to the occult. He was a Luciferian worshiper. He worshipped Satan the devil. He practiced witchcraft. Now, these religious people are, are a danger. Not, not just Catholics or Protestants fighting among themselves, setting off bombs and blowing each other up, or a, a battle between Muslims and Christians over supremacy of, uh, of religious ideology in the world. I mean, there's other people out there that are dangerous religious extremists also. And they just scared the bejesus out of me. I try to stay as far away from these religious people as I can get. These people are dangerous. Now, next time, we'll take a look at this thing of the Tuskegee study. The Tuskegee study. That's where they took black men in the South and gave them venereal disease so that they could study the effects of venereal disease on reproduction. Well, wasn't it just real special that they picked blacks? I mean, we wouldn't want to experiment on white Anglo-Saxon wasps, would we? Now, you talk about racism in its most blatant form. See, the blacks aren't just whistling Dixie through a straw hat. I think they play their race card a little bit too often until it becomes obnoxious. But they're not totally, totally out to lunch especially when you read some of these articles by some of these New Age people who have in mind the eradication of blacks, Hispanics, and American Indians. Talk about genocide now, huh? Well, I'm about out of time. We'll have to leave it right there. We'll take it up right here, the famous Tuskegee study, next time when we come back. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on Internet or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. Then, when you subscribe, we will send you the last quarterly MP3 CD of that program immediately and continue to do so with each new quarter. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host cause and anywhere else the spirit may lead you do all to the glory of our god and creator for his holy nation the only kingdom that will last forever thank you for listening
Gold and silver is tremendously undervalued. Global demand vastly exceeds mine supply by more than 60% annually. There is little in the financial world more certain than a coming explosion in the prices of gold and silver. The U.S. dollar continues to lose value and respect as the world's reserve currency. Our nation faces challenges on many fronts, and a day doesn't pass without another economist bringing forth warnings of impending economic calamity. There has never been a better time than right now to acquire physical gold and silver. Discount Gold and Silver Trading was founded on the principles of truth and honesty. We believe in providing a quality product, quality service, and most importantly, competitive pricing. We provide all forms of precious metals, including American gold, silver, platinum, and rare investment and circulated coins. Silver bars, rounds, and 90% silver bags are on hand for the silver investor. Gold self-directed IRAs are available. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, that's 1-800-375-4188. Hear it first on FirstAmendmentRadio.com and FirstAmendmentRadio.net. American Family News on the Hour. I'm Chad Groney. Houston area got a break from rainy weather most of the day Wednesday, but the water is now making its way downstream, prompting officials to ask some residents to evacuate. Harris County officials say last night the San Jacinto River was nearly three feet above its flood stage. In North Texas, the Brazos River is expected to rise above its flood stage of 21 feet some.